hello, hello, welcome. It's time for that Vid Blaster guy. That's me, Tom Sinclair. Glad to be with you again today. Another exciting episode. Well, I guess it's going to be exciting. If it's exciting, your life is really dull and boring like mine. I tell you what. Uh, but it's, it's going to be fun. If you're into internet broadcasting, this is the place to come get all sorts of great info. The, the premise here is that one guy with one PC can do one awesome broadcast. If you've got the right software, I think. I think VidBlaster is the right software. And broadcasting is a lot of fun. If you've got a passion for something and you want to bring it to the rest of the world, and I mean literally the world, you can do that with one PC and, and VidBlaster. Today we're going to be talking about how to do it for church broadcasting, and that's going to be a lot of fun. And then towards the tail end of the show, we'll be announcing our second winner in the VidBlaster giveaway contest. Ooh, that's going to be, and it was a really good video too. I was really excited about that. But it's not too late if you're thinking about entering. I mean, it's too late for today. But if you're thinking about entering the contest, we're going to be giving away two more copies of the VidBlaster Home Edition. You can get details about how to enter on our website, that vidblasterguide.com. So uh, we're giving them away one every week in November 2013. So uh, don't delay. Shoot that entry into us as quickly as you can. But we're going to start today's show where we're going to talk about we're going to talk about how to get help. What do you do when everything goes plowy? And we'll get to church broadcasting in just a second. But I wanted to talk just a minute about how to get help. How do you troubleshoot? How do you figure out what's going on? And sometimes just asking the right question is the hardest part. But there are a couple of three resources that you can use specifically with VidBlaster to get more information about what's going on. Number one, and it's funny because a lot of people don't go here first, and they could very easily, is help. I mean, right there, I'm looking at it, right there at the top of the screen, right next to file, view, modules, video, is the word help. And if you click it, it says help, F1, or you could just press F1. And there in help is detailed explanation of what every function of VidBlaster is. Now, it doesn't always go into a lot of detail about how to combine different functions. So if you're having problems with that, well, I've got an answer for that in just a second. But for your basic information, use help. It's there. In fact, it makes great late night reading. If you're having trouble getting to sleep at night, pull it up on your phone. While you're drifting off to sleep, you can be looking at, at uh, how to the difference between a camera three module and a camera one module, and that'll put you out like a light. <laughs> but there's all sorts of good stuff there, and uh, it, it is definitely worth reading. And some of it won't make any sense. Some of it will be things that you never, ever use, and don't worry about that. I always skip over the stuff I don't understand anyway and go to the stuff that, that makes sense to me. But the VidBlaster help is always there, always ready to, to, to help you out with whatever you need. The second place you can go to help, go for help, that is a little bit more in-depth is the VidBlaster Wiki. Now, I don't know what Wiki means. Wiki is just kind of a made-up word for who knows what. But what we're all agreeing that it means is sort of like an online encyclopedia. And some great folks, Martin Kay in, in England and others from around the world, have written articles that are contained in the VidBlaster Wiki. And the VidBlaster Wiki um, can, oh, there's, there's great information in there. I mean, good, thorough, in-depth articles about audio, how to make audio work with VidBlaster, capture cards, cameras, mixers, microphones, how to take a remote video stream from somewhere else and bring it in, how to work with Skype, all those kind of how-tos if you're be, get, kind of getting beyond the novice stage and you're getting into the intermediate stage, all those are written up in the wiki, and it's wiki.vidblaster.com. That's W-I-K-I dot vidblaster.com, wiki.vidblaster.com, and you can get great information there. Um, if you need help with a specific problem, that is, you need to interact with somebody, the third layer of help is the VidBlaster forum and that's forum.vidblaster.com. And there are probably not, probably not hundreds of thousands, but tens of thousands of posts in there 
over the years of folks that have uh, tried out different things and they worked or they didn't work or they've brought problems in to have other people help them diagnose. And I'm one of the moderators on the forum and, and like to check in there very regularly and see what's going on and see you know, what, what do folks need? What, what are the problems that are coming up? And when the same problem tends to come up time and time again, that's kind of a trigger to say, ah, we need to address this in the wiki because people are obviously misunderstanding. I remember several years ago, audio was just a huge issue and so uh, several of us wrote articles about how to work with mixers, how VidBlaster works with audio. And the number of audio questions after that dropped dramatically because people could go get that information for themselves and it was presented in a way that made sense to them. So you've got three lines of help. You've got help that's built into VidBlaster. You've got the VidBlaster wiki, wiki.vidblaster.com, and the forum, forum.vidblaster.com. Now, there, if you're buying VidBlaster from VidBlaster.com, that's pretty much the, the amount of help that you've got. But if you buy it from a reseller, by the way, I'm a reseller, full disclosure, you typically can get personalized help from that reseller. And I love talking with my clients about the projects that they're working on and helping them through the challenges of, of achieving the goals that they want to achieve and putting their passions into video. It's, it's a lot of fun. So if you'd like personalized help, I'd be happy to help you. In fact, if you've got VidBlaster and you've got a single question and you want to drop me an email, Tom Sinclair, that be VidBlasterGuy.com, whoops, at VidBlasterGuy.com, and uh, I'll answer your single question. If it's more than that, I'll ask you to buy a support package, and we have those for single issues as well as, uh, as annual things. Excuse me, as well as an annual package if you're interested in that. So enough of that. Uh, but that's, that's how to get help. Help is, help is on the way. <laughs> help is really needed. Oh my goodness. Now, uh, let's see. Let's change over here something real quickly. And we want to go to our big subject for the day. And that is church broadcasting on a budget. Uh, now, remember, you don't have to take notes because this is going to be posted to YouTube later. So you can, uh, you can just listen to your heart's content. And I picked out church broadcasting, but this really could be for almost any event that is in a, a hall or a, um, uh, an auditorium um, or any type of large meeting space where you've got uh, an, a live audience and then a speaker or a presenter or a, a band or a choir, um, whatever it might be. Um, church broadcasting kind of fits that need too. So we'll talk about it in those sort of expanding terms. Um, but why would you want to do this? Why would you want to get into specifically church broadcasting? Well, I can think of one great reason. And I've got a, I've got a friend from my church whose, whose wife is, I, I, I don't know that she's terminally ill, but she has been ill for a long, long time. And, and can't get to church. And he is her sole, um, her sole caregiver. So if she doesn't get to go to church, he doesn't go to church. And to have the ability for them to stay in touch with what's going on in church, uh, the sermons and the prayers or the music or whatever it might be, um, just makes them feel less isolated and more a part of what's going on. There's a great reason to do it right there. Another good reason to, to broadcast your church services is for folks that travel. I was on the road uh, last weekend uh, on the way to, to a different city where my son and daughter-in-law live because we were expecting a baby, or they were expecting a baby. I wasn't expecting a baby. It was a boy, so I'm a granddad again. And, and it would have been nice. I, I didn't have time for it, but had I had it, it would have been great to sit down and, and, and participate in the, the church service and uh, even from a distance and listen to the sermon and stay in touch with what was going on. And frequently, uh, you can, not frequently, but you can also record and save these and make them available on demand so that folks that did miss church because they had an activity on Sunday morning can still pick up on, on the message later on in the week by, by going to the, the video on demand. The third reason I can think of for doing church broadcasting is to spread the word. 
churches have a wonderful message, and that message uh, is like none other. And what better opportunity to spread the word than by the great technology that has presented itself to us in the last, uh, the la I'd say the last five years, but really the last 20 years or 30 years, if you include television. And, but this doesn't have to be, you know, I see folks out there already, they're, they're saying, oh, I'm thinking of a televangelist. You know, that's not what we had in mind. And that's really not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having folks in your hometown that have just moved into town and they're looking for a church and maybe they're a little um, reluctant to make a personal visit, but they can make an online visit and they can see what you guys look like and that you, you don't have wings or, or you know, you're not mean and nasty or anything like that, whatever the case may be. You know how folks make judgments on, on what, where they want to go and what they want to do. Um, they can taste a little bit without having to uh, get their feet wet, as it were. So there are lots of good reasons to do the, the church broadcasting. And you don't have to spend a lot of money. That's the on the budget part right here. You don't have to spend a ton of money to make that happen. You can do it with, excuse me just a second, let me get rid of this little guy that's troubling me here. There we go. Um, you, you can do it either as a, a proof of concept by throwing together you know, a hodgepodge of equipment, or you can do it uh, based on a budget. And I wanna walk you through some of the major elements that you'll need for a, a church broadcast. Um, the very first thing we're gonna need is the ability to capture video. And the first thing that you always need when you capture video is a camera. Now, for some folks, you know, they're thinking, oh my goodness, a broadcast camera, that's gonna be, you know, $2,000 and, you know, it's SDI cables and HD and all that. And wait, hold on a second. I would bet if your congregation or your church or your fellowship is like mine, half the people have got a video camera of some kind sitting on a shelf in a closet somewhere that they're not using. Now, not all of those are gonna be suitable for broadcasting, but a lot of them will. Most of the time, folks are gonna be using, I think, standard definition. And so almost any camera will do that. I've got a camera that I use. Um, let me show you this over the shoulder shot. This is a, a shot that I, a camera that I use. It's a, it's a Panasonic. It's a 320 by 240 resolution. Um, standard definition, I mean, excuse me, less than standard definition, and, but, it's, but it does okay. It's not the best in the world, but it, it does okay. And if that's all you have, and you're doing a proof, proof of concept, that is you wanna to prove to somebody this will work before you spend any money on it, that'll get you up off the ground. Now, um, obviously, Better cameras are gonna give you a better picture. A quality camera will make the whole video look much better. Um, I, you can put two cameras side by side that look the same and the quality on, on one in the glass, that is in the lenses, can give you, and in the, um, the sensor, can give you a, a much better, cleaner picture. And so, uh, you know, Obviously, that, that's, that's what you want, but you don't have to start there. You can start with just about anything. Once you've got your camera selection down, then it's a matter of getting the camera uh, video into, let me pull up one of my little, uh, my little show and tells here. It's a matter of getting the video into the computer. And so you're gonna wanna, most, most cameras will come with a cable like this one. And this little connector right here plugs into the camera, and then it'll either have a two or a three jack output. And the only one we're really worried about is the video, because we're not gonna take the, excuse me, take the audio from the camera. And this is what's referred to as an RCA jack or a composite connector. And that will allow us to hook the camera. We'll get the video on the cable, 
and that'll come down to this jack, and then we can plug that jack into something else. Now, there are all sorts of devices that you can plug it into. Uh, here's an old one that uh, I used for a long time called an Easy Cap, and it, it plugs into the USB port on your computer, and as you can tell, it's got a matching video connector. Again, we're not worried about the audio. If you've got S-Video coming out of your camera, you can use S-Video on that. But um, there's so many different versions of this good old Easy Cap on the market today that, that, and some work well and some don't, but if you're not sure, um, my recommendation is that you go with the Easy Cap Dot TV. They sell them uh, in Europe and in the U.S. EZCAP.TV. It's about 30 bucks U.S. And again, it allows you to connect one camera to the PC through the USB port. And I've had success with the EZCAP TV actually connecting up to three cameras. Uh, it depends a lot, I think, on the PC that you're using as to ha just how many you can, you can get. But uh, there, when I used to do a lot of sports streaming and sometimes would use a laptop, I could get, uh, depending, on, depending on the laptop, I could get up to three cameras in there. But you'll want to test that and see for yourself. So now you've got the video. You've got the video captured and you've got the video into the PC. Let's talk about the next part of the puzzle and that's the audio. Now, a lot of churches will already have a audio function in the church. That is, they'll have a microphone and a PA, and somewhere between that microphone and that PA, or the speakers, will be a mixer, an audio mixer or a soundboard. It comes by lots of different names. And I'm, I'm queuing up my next, uh, my next show and tell here. Um, the audio mixer at the at the church will probably have an output that, uh, that you can connect to so that whatever is being broadcast in the church can be picked up and routed into your broadcast over the internet. Remember, on the, the internet now, people at home will only hear the audio that you let them hear. And so if there's folks that are speaking out of the congregation, unless they're mic'd or there's some sort of uh, boom mic or something, some allowance to pick up their audio, that, that's not gonna, it's, it's not gonna happen. I know in my church, uh, we've got uh, microphones that are mounted at lecterns and places like that where, uh, where people will speak or read scripture. And then in the choir, most of the folks in the choir, each person in the choir has their own mic. Um, and then the, the priest, the, the pastor, uh, has wireless mic. So pretty well everything that people are expected to hear uh, is, is mic'd and therefore is available to be picked up from the audio board. Now, you may or may not have um, access to the audio board during the course of, of a service or an event. So it may make sense to, to, to bring your own. This is a small uh, Behringer X502 mixer that I use on occasion when I need to get audio from somebody else and then put it into my system. Um, I want to be able to control the, the volume. I want to be able to, to have some control over what's coming into the system before it comes into my PC. Now this particular mixer, um, as you can see, has only got one XLR input, so you can only have one mic. It's got several uh, line ends, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Um, so you could have uh, five quarter inch jacks coming in, um, and then it has the ability to mix those in a kind of a random pattern, and then has a uh, headphone jack main outs, and then uh, the CD tape in and out. And there are various ways to go from these. I would probably take the main outs as uh, two quarter inch jacks and have it convert down to a eighth inch stereo jack so that I could plug that into the microphone port on my laptop or into the uh, uh, line in port on my PC. 
if I had a mixer that had USB, uh, like the, the USB version of that mixer or other USB mixers, then, then that wouldn't be necessary. I can just plug the one cable in. Um, the, um, the other thing about audio is if the church doesn't have its own sound system, then you're going to have to pretty well rig it up yourself. And one of the easiest ways to do that, I think, is probably, and again, let me cue up my, my goodies here, uh, is probably going to be with, with a wireless system. Now, this is a very inexpensive uh, Audio Technica system. Trying to read the, uh, the model number off of it. Uh, ATW A250 is the receiver. I think actually this one's not allowed by the FCC anymore because of the, the bandwidth is being used by local fire and police. Um, but uh, I think this cost uh, maybe 125, 150 US. Has a pretty decent range. Uh, you have to supply your own lavalier mic with it, which would plug in here. This is the pack that would would be carried by the speaker, and this would be connected to your mixer by a quarter-inch cable. As you can see, the quarter-inch output on the back. Um, this one is battery-operated. This one plugs in, but and you can see it's got little antennas that uh, can be extended to extend its range. So something like that is a great way to, to pick up uh, an, an extra speaker um, or if you're in a, in a venue that doesn't have any sound of its own, uh, you can pick up just that audio from the speaker for your broadcast only. Okay, let's move on to the next. So we've got audio, we've got video, and we're putting it into a PC. You've got a couple of different options for PCs. Um, the option number one is whatever you've got laying around. And my guess is that just like with cameras, there are folks in, in the church or in the organization that have got a cast off computer that they're not using anymore that might, might be powerful enough to, to pull all this together for you. Uh, if, it's, if it's older than I'd say, you know, four or five years, yeah, probably it's not going to do what you need to do. Um, but if it's younger than that, uh, or more especially if it has an i7 Intel processor, then it's probably game. It's probably going to do. Again, for proof of concept, you don't have to be perfect. Uh, you just want to prove that this will work and that it's, it's a viable alternative. And then if you have to spend some money later to make upgrades or to replace, uh, replace things, at least you know what you need. Um, but for the basic PC, you know, the specs that I would use would be an i7 Intel processor, at least 8 gigs of RAM, um, a, uh, a hard drive that is a 7200 RPM hard drive, preferably a solid state hard drive. But, you know, again, that's an upgrade that you can make later. If you're saving your videos, your hard drive, uh, you probably want a second hard drive to, to load those onto to record, uh, I mean, excuse me, to store so that you don't uh, have those interfering and, and clogging up your main drive. I know uh, I was talking to a friend the other day who, uh, was, who was having trouble with the PC that he was recording his videos on and uh, come to find out that the hard drive was just slammed full. And he, he needed to shuffle some, some things off of that drive because he wanted to save them. And so he put them on a second drive that he already had in his PC. Uh, so far, people become concerned on PCs with video cards. Uh, from VidBlaster's standpoint, VidBlaster doesn't use the, vid the video card for any video processing. So you need not purchase a video card if you're building a PC if the, uh, if the motherboard you're using has onboard video. So you can use the, the built-in onboard video uh, or you can add a, a, a video card if you like. Um, let's see, what other parts are we can start? Obviously, you know, mouse, keyboard, screen, that kind of thing. Um, it's always nice to have a power backup. So if the power goes out, you've got a few minutes to, to shut everything down so it doesn't shut itself down quite so quickly. 
there are, there are lots of tweaks that you could do to the hardware to, to squeeze as much CPU power out of them as possible, but that'll be the subject of another video. We're just trying to give you the overview here at this point. So you've got your audio, you've got your video, you've got both of those coming into your PC, and now it's time to talk about software. And you'd say, okay, Tom, obviously it's going to be VidBlaster. But, yeah, there's some other things, too. Now, VidBlaster is going to, going to be the software that's going to take your camera or cameras as inputs. It's going to take the, the audio and, and record the audio and the video. But VidBlaster can also allow you to play um, some soft music while you're waiting for things to get started, music that only the folks at home will hear. Um, you can uh, play a video that was pre-recorded that might be a special welcome message from the pastor or the priest or someone in the church to the folks that are watching online to explain what this online process is and what these buttons do if you want if depending on what uh, what player you're using on your website um, so that folks can feel at home as if they're warm and welcomed, as if they were welcomed at the front door of the church. The, um, the other things that VidBlaster would allow you to do, specific to church, uh, would be things like, um, like overlays. Like this, this is an overlay, what's called a lower third. And this lower third obviously uh, doesn't have to be just down at the third. It can be up on the side. It can be, uh, it, it, it could actually overlay the whole screen if we wanted it to uh, as a transparent overlay. Uh, there are lots of different ways to, to use the overlay function and it's a, it's a lot of fun and I think makes things look a little bit more professional and helps feel, people feel more comfortable if they know what's going on and know who the players are and, and know what's coming next. Those kinds of things can really help. Other software that you'll want to have in your software arsenal will be an encoding software. VidBlaster is not an encoder. You say, well, what's an encoder and why do I need one? An encoder is, is a, a, a piece of software that basically cuts the video up into little teeny pieces and puts those pieces on the internet and poof, off they go. And then it, it gets re-encoded on the other end. And the encoder is software at least in our cases, it's gonna be software. And there's a free one from Adobe, excuse me, called Flash Media Live Encoder, F-M-L-E. And I'll put a link in the show notes to how to get that free encoder. And VidBlaster works nicely, at least for the most part, with that encoder. Other software, and I need to look at my notes here. Other software that you might want to have uh, would be something that could uh, produce these lower thirds. I use um, Paintbrush Pro. I bought it off the internet for nine dollars, and so that was a pretty good deal. I didn't, I didn't actually make this uh, this lower third. A friend made it for me, but you need to be able to produce graphics on a on a regular basis, even if it's just nothing more than uh, we'll be right back. Um, but something that 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 fits with the broadcast that you're doing. Um, another piece of software that I use that uh, was uh, maybe $100, $150, I don't really recall right now, was Adobe Premiere Elements, and that allows me to edit video. So if I have um, a recording, but I started the recorder too soon, I can clip off the extra. Or if I let the recorder run too long, I can clip off the end of it. And so a, a, a video recording software is nice to have, and there, there are others available. That's the one that I just chose. Um, so now you've got, the, uh, you've got the audio, you've got the video, you've got the PC, you've got the software. VidBlaster's putting all this stuff together, and you're going to be recording it, but that's a, a process that's within VidBlaster, and you're going to record it to a file and later on you can upload that file to YouTube or some other location if you want to. But then there's the streaming part of it. And in order to stream, you need something called a CDN or a content delivery network. Now a CDN is a, well, it's, it's kind of like a website 
that takes your video stream and then makes it available to all sorts of other folks to watch whenever they want, or not whenever, they, well, depending on what the CDN does, they can either watch it live or watch it later, what they call on demand. And there are lots of CDNs. Uh, I think if you Google CDNs, you're gonna get three trillion hits. Some of them are free, that's always interesting. And if you're doing proof of concept, you might wanna start out with a free CDN. Some of them are paid. Some of them are actually oriented directly and specifically for churches. The, the free ones, I know I got your attention when I said free, the free ones actually uh, support themselves by running ads, at least for the most part. So you kinda have to deal with whatever you get. Now, some of them will say, well, we'll try to make our ads compatible with whatever you're broadcasting. So if, we're, if you're broadcasting church, they're not gonna run a Budweiser beer commercial, at least hopefully not, but you never know. Um, some of the free CDNs that are available are Ustream, uh, Justin TV, Daily Motion. All of these are fairly popular and easy to use free CDNs. The CDN that I'm using right now, if you're watching this broadcast live, is called DaCast, D-A-C-A-S-T, DaCast.com. It's a paid CDN. It's about $25 a month. And I buy for $25 a month what's called bandwidth. And that is the ability to send and let you receive a live or recorded video. Now, the longer the video, the more bandwidth. The higher resolution the video, the more bandwidth. So you get to choose. You know, am I going to have five-hour shows? I'm going to pay for a lot. Am I going to have um, 1080p or high-definition resolution? I'll pay a lot if I'm paying for that bandwidth. I don't use 1080p. I use 480p. So it's much lower resolution. And as a result, my bandwidth bills are less. My picture is not perfect, but it's good enough for you to get the message. There are some specific CDNs that are oriented to churches. They include uh, SermonCast, Sunday Stream. Now, I don't have any personal experience with these. I just Googled them like you will. And they seem to be reasonably priced. They, some of them will offer to have a complete website that you can link to that will have your your stream in it. Uh, others might allow you to take just the video portion of the stream, which they will be responsible for, and embed that like a window in your website. So your church's website would have a what they call a player on it, and that player becomes a window that allows you to see the video that's stored or being broadcast live from the CDN. And the player can be port of a screen, it can be most of the screen, or it can be the whole screen. Or people can adapt it to different sizes depending on what they want to do. If they want to watch it from across the room, they would go full screen. And if they just wanted to have it sort of running on the side while they were doing other things, they might have it as the, the smaller version. And so the CDN would provide you or, or the webmaster for your church website with embed codes that would go into the, the website to allow the player to appear. It's probably more complicated than it sounds. <laughs> so you've got the CDN that's, that's receiving the broadcast from you and it's sending it out to all the folks that wanna watch. And the CDN can do it one of two ways. They can broadcast it live and or they can record it or you can record it and send it to them later and then people can watch it later on demand. So that's gonna be the video, the audio, the PC hardware, the software, and now the CDN. Now it's time for everything else. Where are you gonna put all this equipment in the church? If your church already has an, a broadcast booth or an audio booth, you might be able to, to get a, a little portion of that. Where are you gonna put the cameras? Are the cameras gonna be permanently mounted or will they 
um, and that is a fixed camera that's pointed in one location, or will they require an operator so they can zoom in and pan back and forth to, to get all the activities that's going on? They actually make cameras that are remote controlled that will pan, that is go side to side, and zoom by remote control so they can be mounted on a wall somewhere, a place that you wouldn't normally put a camera operator in a camera and have someone that's operating the camera from a back room somewhere. Um, other parts of et cetera are security. Are you gonna leave all this equipment there all during the week or is it just gonna be uh, brought out and, and set up for the services, Wednesday night services, Sunday services, Saturday night services, whenever your services are. Uh, what type of security is available so people won't be trying to go watch YouTube videos or, or do their homework on a streaming PC? If you've got a, a PC that you have built or, or having built or have purchased specifically for the streaming process, you really need to dedicate that to the streaming process and not add a lot of other software on it. You'd be amazed how many PCs that I'm helping folks with that are loaded down with all sorts of applications that want just a little bit of CPU uh, space, just a little bit of RAM space. And before you know it, your PC is reduced in its, in its power by 10 or 15%. That's no good. Probably the biggest part of the et cetera portion is going to be internet access. What kind of access do you have to the internet from that specific location in the church? Is there a line, DSL or cable or fiber, um, already coming into that area? Or are you gonna have to bring it or, or have it put in yourself? If it's proof of concept, again, if it's something temporary, you just wanna prove the point, you might be able to, uh, to borrow a, um, a Wi-Fi uh, device that would uh, be hooked up to a local uh, cell company, cellular service. For example, I have one from Verizon that allows me to, to hook up anything that runs on Wi-Fi wirelessly to that device, and then that device hooks up to Verizon's 4G network. If you have one of the newer smartphones, like a Samsung Galaxy 4, for example, uh, there's a setting in that particular phone where that phone can be used as a hotspot. And so whatever PC you're using, if that will go wirelessly and you can bring along your phone, then you've got a pretty decent connection to the internet. What's a decent connection? For DSL, you're, you're gonna get anywhere from 300 kbps to maybe a, a meg. Um, and that's gonna be a little restrictive, I think. I mean, a meg probably will be enough, but 300 would probably not be enough. Uh, a Wi-Fi device or a smartphone um, will probably give you anywhere from a meg to five megs. I've gotten as many as eight megs up upload. And by the way, all these speeds are, are the uplink number, not the downlink number. Um, the upload is typically the slower of the, of the services that you can get. And in this case, this is the more important one, that uplink number. So you want an uplink number that's that I would hope would be greater than, than a meg, and that will give you the ability to do all sorts of things. Uh, now you say, well, I'm only streaming at 500K, why do I need a meg? Well, you're streaming at 500K, but a megabyte connection is going to ebb and flow. Um, it, it, the internet just kind of surges and pauses all by itself, and so you want the ability to not be affected by that so you want to basically take whatever your broadcast speed is and double it so that you've got headroom in case there are problems with the internet. Um, otherwise, it's gonna buffer your stream and folks on the other end are gonna see a, see a pause. Okay, so we've got video, we've got audio, we've got, uh, we've got PC, we've got software, we've got CDNs, We've got a location for all this stuff. We've got a way to get it up to the internet. And now the rest is up to you to make sure folks are aware of it, uh, to talk within the church. What type of policies are you going to have? Uh, are you going to, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are people that would prefer not to be shown, not to have their faces shown other places. Some churches have simply said, hey, 
if you're in the church, you better be prepared to have your face face seen. Um, if not, you need to go sit in a different section. Um, but whatever you need, whatever you need to do, you need to make sure that everybody's on board with it, so that nobody is taken by surprise, um, because. The, the downside to that, you know, could be could be pretty far down. I mean, I can imagine somebody in a witness protection program or, or something like that that suddenly is identified when they didn't want to be. Um, so you don't want to you don't want to give away somebody's identity, in the, in those situations. You want to respect that. Um, and obviously, all of this would have to have the approval of of your governing board, uh, what, whoever they might be, and the leadership in the church. And hopefully these ideas have come out of the leadership in the church so you don't have to go sell this concept to somebody. That's really the, the idea, folks. That's, that's, that's it. That's church broadcasting on a budget in a nutshell. I would imagine that you would spend, if you had to buy everything that we've talked about, uh, but buying it on the low end, i.e. off of eBay or at garage sales or off of Craigslist, that you could do all this for $1,000 or less, depending on how good a shopper you are. If you're doing it, and, and, and that would be, you know, proof of, con, pr, excuse me, proof of concept. Um, you know, if I were doing proof of concept, I wouldn't be above borrowing equipment from somebody and saying, hey, can you just let me borrow this for a week so that I can prove the concept? Um, that way I might be able to get better equipment than I would if I had to get it out of my closet or somebody else's closet. If you want to do this uh, more than just proof of concept and you're looking for a long-term installation, uh, be prepared to spend three, three or $4,000 on everything. And that's, you know, cables and, and tripods and monitors and keyboards and PCs and softwares and cameras and mixers and mics and, and all that you might need to put it all together. When all is said and done, that's about the budget that you're going to do for, for a fairly basic setup. If you're talking about HD with uh, several cameras, um, you know, remote, a remote control camera can go $1,000 uh, by itself. Um, HD, maybe even more. So you can, you can spend as much money as you want to, but you don't have to spend all that don't have, all that, have to spend all that. Well, that's been church broadcasting on a budget. If you have questions about that and you think I can help you, shoot me an email, tom at thatvidblasterguy.com, and I would be happy to give it a go. Um, and if you want to see some examples of church broadcasting, um, my goodness, Google church broadcasting, and you will pick up hundreds and hundreds of or, or Google uh, church CDN, or church webcasting, or church streaming, and you will see l probably thousands of churches out there of all shapes and sizes, of all flavors and colors that are doing broadcasting. And some of them are doing it very well, and some of them are doing it very poorly, but they're doing it, and that's, that's the important thing, because you have to start somewhere. You, you can't start, you can't, you can't be perfect first time out of the box. That's for sure. I, I, I can vouch for that on that bit blaster guy. Okay, well, that is the subject, our main subject for today. I want to move on now to, um, to our giveaway contest. We are giving away a home edition of that, of, of that vid blaster guy, of, excuse me, of vid blaster software, uh, value in the United States of 195. Now, if you already have VidBlaster and uh, you're interested in this contest, well, we will give you that much in credit towards an upgrade, a, a version or an addition upgrade, if you want to upgrade your VidBlaster. The, um, the contest winner this week, um, let me get my notes here, um, actually used seven modules. Of course, that, that, was the, that was the restriction on the seven modules. And uh, he used a, a recorder module, obviously, so that he could record the show. He used a monitor module, obviously, so that there was something to record. Uh, he used a player, so he, he incorporated some, some video into it. He used PowerPoint. He used two cameras and used an overlay. And actually used an overlay and did a, a basically, let's see, let me turn this overlay off. And um, we can turn on an overlay like this, 
and I can actually change the text in it um, on my keyboard. So I can write in anything I want to, kind of a quick and dirty text editor. And apparently he used that and then cut and pasted from somewhere else and popped it in and so was able to get essentially the function of two overlays out of one overlay module. I thought that was pretty cool. Probably the coolest, well, one of the coolest parts of that, uh, of that submission was that he sent me his show notes where he had outlined what the show was going to look like and what the, what the resources were that he was going to use and even some, some footnotes and references to, to websites where he'd gotten the information. So I thought the show was very well documented um, and want to uh, award the second prize, the, the second first place prize, the second first place prize to uh, Timothy McGowan for his video called um, that, well, what, 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 that scanner guy. That scanner guy. Now that has a certain ring to it, does it? That scanner guy. Well, let, let me show you the video. Here is, here is Timothy McGowan. Congratulations, Timothy. everybody, I'm Timothy McGowan, that scanner guy. Now the intent of my show is what's commonly called police scanners are pretty popular amongst people. And um, I work for the fire department, got 34 years in the fire service, and a lot of people like listening to the fire department. The problem is they don't necessarily understand what they're hearing. And you hear in news media a lot of times, so we'll just sit here and they'll just uh, speculate on uh, what's going on. So. I thought what I'd do is take my years of experience, my enjoyment of t listening to scanners as a hobby, and become a teacher. Teach those how to listen to scanners, teach them what they're listening to so they can get much better enjoyment out of the hobby. So that's the goal here and I hope that uh, we can accomplish that. So today what we're going to do is we're going to take on some terminology. only have time for two quick terms. One of them is ICP. That stands for Incident Command Post. Well, what is an Incident Command Post? The Incident Command Post is the location um, where the boss or the man controlling the fire or the emergency incident is located. It's the incident uh, base, more than likely. Sometimes it's just the back of the battalion chief's suburban. Could be the fire captain, so it's at his fire engine. On a major wildland fire like we have in Southern California, it may be at a community regional park uh, and take up acres and acres of logistics and support personnel and equipment. So incident command post is that what's here to uh, assist and function in the incident command system. As you see here on the chart, it starts with the incident commander. That's usually the first arriving person on scene. And then we'll get bumped up to higher ranking officers as they start to expand this structure. Now you see it's quite complex. Well, not every incident needs that. A simple house fire, you may only fill a couple of those positions, but you get the idea. The other term we'd like to talk about is a strike team. What is a strike team? Um, pretty commonly used uh, terminology in, some, in the incident command system, and that is a strike team is a grouping of like kind and type of resource to uh, accomplish a goal. It's an easier way. Like if I'm on a wildland fire, I can ask for a strike team of type 3 engines, and then I know exactly what I get. It's an easier way of ordering, uh, and it just makes things a whole lot simpler. Well, what do I mean by kind and type? Well, let's take engines as an example, because it's what everybody's familiar with. It has to do with capabilities and what they carry. For example, you see here on the left, the type 1 engine. That's your typical everyday engine that goes to structure fires and medical emergencies, traffic accidents throughout your community. On the right, a Type 3 engine, commonly referred to as a wildland engine or a brush truck. Let's take a look at some of the capabilities. First of all, the pump, required to have a minimum of 100, or I'm sorry, 1,000 gallons per minute, 
for a Type 1 engine, although they're commonly up to 1,500 gallons per minute. Consequently, the Type 3 only has 150 gallons per minute pump. Water, 300 uh, gallons as you see here for the structure engine, because they're usually located near a hydrant. Where out in the wildlands, and you have no readily available hydrant, you need 500 gallons for some extra capability. Hose, two and a half inch hose is commonly a large uh, diameter hose for a, a large structure fire. It use up water too fast and you really don't need that much water on a uh, brush fire. So type three engines don't even carry any. Consequently, a one and a half inch hose line is pretty common for a quick little vehicle fire or structure fire of a residential variety. So a type one engine can carry 500 up to 500 feet where the brush truck, the inch and a half hose line is the, our mainstay. That's the hose we carry on our backs and we, uh, we unroll and progress up the hill and make our own waterway. So we carry a thousand feet. One inch hose? Well, that's typically just a little mop-up hose and it's great on wildland fires. Problem is, really has no place on a structure fire. So a type one engine doesn't carry any to where a type three engine does. Now let's talk about bulldozers. Type 1 bulldozer is a heavy bulldozer up to 200 horsepower and is a Caterpillar D7 or D8. Where a Type 3 dozer, it's a lighter bulldozer, only 50 horsepower and it's in the D4 size. What this means is maybe you have an area you need to get a bulldozer into but it, uh, the big dozers won't fit or because of certain things you need a lot of material moved like a big giant mulch pile or something that the D4 just doesn't have enough strength, then you call in a heavy and you get a type 1 dozer. I hope that kind of explains how strike teams, uh, the, the uh, class and type, but that doesn't end there. An engine strike team, like in my example I mentioned I'd ask for a uh, type 3 engine strike team, this is what I'd get. It's five type 3 engines and a leader. A leader is usually a battalion chief, but it doesn't have to be. The strike teams have like units with common communications and a leader. And people tend to think of groups of five. But that's not necessarily the case. Because in a bulldozer strike team or a dozer strike team, you won't get five. You only get two and your leader. Oh, and the other unit? That's the tender. So the dozer tender, that's a support unit. And what that does is that uh, the swamper will go there, the extra help for the dozer operator. He has parts, tools, and some extra diesel fuel and materials that the dozer strike team will need. So that's kind of uh, what a dozer strike team is like. Okay, although that was just a quick lesson, I hope that gives you kind of an idea what I kind of want to accomplish. Now, in the show, obviously we're going to need some feedback. And if you had any feedback on this show, although these are fictitious and not real at this point, you can email us at feedback at thatscannerguy.com or leave us a voicemail message at 760-555-1212. We'd enjoy hearing from you so we can improve the quality of our show. Well, just a couple of things in, the, in summary. I really enjoyed making this, and I'd like to uh, close by thanking Tom Sinclair with That Vid Blaster Guy, who's helping really get me motivated to do this. He's really helped me understand this. So I hope you vote for me because I'd really like to get this show on the air. And we'll talk soon. Thanks for watching. How about that? Well done, Timothy. Goodness gracious. A lot of time and energy went into that. Oh, let me show you this. This is really cool. This is, uh, these are his show notes. And he has, uh, get my mouse out of the way here, basically has, has walked through the whole show, uh, how he's going to use his modules, uh, what are the resources he needs, uh, what the slides were that he used. Um, and identified just about every part of it. 
and we're not sure. It says that the show name, that scanner guy, is uh, used only in the pilots and not meant, it was meant as a hat tip to that vid blaster guy. So we'll see if it ends up being that scanner guy long term or not. Uh, but Timothy, congratulations. Uh, we'll get together with you and figure out how to get that vid blaster software to you and know that you're going to be making good use of it. If you're interested in the contest, go to our website, thatvidblasterguide.com, and read the contest rules there. Basically, you have to, it, there's some limitations on how you do it. And, and so we want you to have fun with it. And maybe this is a show that you've always wanted to do, and this is the impetus to, to get it moving. And if you didn't win this time, well, resubmit or take back your entry and polish it up a little bit. Now you see what we're looking for. And I uh, want to see all sorts of different ways to use VidBlaster within the limitations that are, that are in the program. So congratulations again to Timothy. Uh, new things coming up with this program, that VidBlaster guy. Uh, we are spinning off a show from this. You know, successful shows always spin off. And, uh, and unsuccessful shows sometimes spin off. So we're spinning off a, uh, a show. We haven't exactly settled on a title for it yet, but it will be a little bit more, uh, it'll be sort of generic broadcasting. Um, you know, as we went through the church broadcasting portion, for example, you know, VidBlaster was, was key to it all, but it was just a small piece of the puzzle. Well, we want to talk about the rest of the puzzle in this other show. Um, and it will be, again, geared to folks that are, that are just getting started people that are there are newbies and intermediates um, and are trying to get things put together and are either need some assistance to get things going or have gotten things going and now need some guidance to get things straightened out and improved. Uh, because once you get past the intermediate level, you don't need to watch a show. You've, you've got it all figured out. You're spending all your time getting your show material together. So the, uh, the, Kind of the core of that show will be built around a, uh, a cadre of co-hosts um, so that uh, the co-host doesn't have to show up every week. They can show up uh, once a month, once every six weeks, and when they do, bring a special report in based on a piece of hardware or software or a gadget or a concept, um, whatever it might be, to share with the rest of the bunch. So if you're interested in being one of that cadre of co-hosts, we're taking names, taking numbers. Shoot me an email, tom at thatvidblasterguy.com. I'd love to talk to you about it, and I'm delighted with the folks that, uh, that I've talked with so far, those, especially those that have said yes. There's some that said, oh, I'll think about it. And, and if I haven't asked you specifically, I probably just haven't gotten around to it. So don't take that, uh, don't take that to heart. Shoot me an email and let me know that you're interested, even though I didn't ask you specifically. Um, the other thing that we're doing with, uh, with a new show is, uh, we're spinning off a, uh, oh, what's the best way to call it? Well, it's going to be VidBlaster 101. That's, we've already got the name for it. And it's going to be intended for folks that are just getting started with VidBlaster. For example, if, uh, you purchased from our store at thatvidblaster.com, a license to VidBlaster, let's say it was the home license, the, it would come with a free subscription to VidBlaster 101. And in VidBlaster 101 would be a series of 10, 20, 30, not sure exactly at this point, uh, short instructional videos of how to use VidBlaster and how to connect cameras, connect audio, all the kinds of things that we talked about with church broadcasting today but in, in much more detail for somebody that's just starting out, assuming that they don't know anything, but they have a passion and they want to make a broadcast. So VidBlaster 101 will be for, will come free with every version of VidBlaster purchased from my store. And if you bought VidBlaster from somebody else and you still want it, you can get a subscription to it and we'll have more details on that as it becomes available. Um, for folks that are in the intermediate stage, uh, we'll be starting VidBlaster University before too long. That may take a little longer to get off the drawing boards. And that'll be geared more towards folks that are doing more intermediate stuff. They don't need the newbie assistance anymore. Uh, they're ready to, to go on and do, uh, 
do bigger and better things. So three new shows coming up in the future. Um, unnamed, unnamed generic show. Not sure what we're looking it, it may be something like One Guy, One PC. We'll just have to see how that one works out. And then VidBlaster 101 and VidBlaster U. So it's going to be an exciting year, 2014. Look for those in the future. Um, we've, we've run out of time again today. Sorry about that. It was a delight to be with you. I hope you will tune in to us live again next Wednesday at, oh no, next Wednesday is uh, Thanksgiving, so we won't be doing a live show next Wednesday. Uh, check our website, that VidBlaster guy, or check our Twitter feed, at VidBlaster guy, for information on when our show next week will be, because we will be doing a, a show next week in order to give away another copy of that of VidBlaster, but it will not be on Wednesday, so stay tuned for more details on that. But typically, our shows are every Wednesday at 3 o'clock Eastern, uh, 8 o'clock in London, and whatever time it is in Australia, uh, I think actually it's uh, 6 or 7 a.m. on Thursdays in Australia, so we have a lot of folks from down under that, that tune in. And, of course, if you haven't already and you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe and you'll get notifications when we upload another YouTube video. And if you have any questions, shoot me an email, Tom at that VidBlaster guy. I'd be delighted to help however I can. So with that, we will, uh, we will take a hike and, uh, and see you next time.